If it's possible, it's possible. If it's not possible, it's not possible. Ben Yedda in here. There's the goal. The Sevilla have been threatening. This and Ben Yedda has put Manchester United in deep, deep trouble. We went from David Moyes run down the wing, cross it and do it like 50 million times. They went from LVG, pass, 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 like a team of crabs sideways anyway. And now we've gone to park the bus, no tactics whatsoever. Where do we go from here? If tomorrow rains in London, it's my fault. You know, if there is some difficulty to have the agreement of the Brexit, it's my fault. He's rapid and he's through and he wraps it up for Tottenham. United's worst start since their very first Premier League campaign in 1992. It's a scoreline that will resonate around the football world. The Cheltenham Show on OTB Sports. Don't feel like a punter. Feel like a favourite this Cheltenham with Paddy Power. All right, you're very welcome along to the Cheltenham Show here, brought to you in association with Paddy Power. Don't feel like a punter, feel like a favourite this Cheltenham. It's a little bit of a false start for us here on the show this morning, but we're going to go at it this time again, and I'm delighted to say that uh, all the lads are still with us. John, how are you? Yeah, good, Jerry, yeah. Johnny Ward, how are you? Yeah, it was getting a bit emotional there, all that uh, commentary of, from Galway BFM of Galway winning the Hurling Championship and all that. I was, I was actually getting lost, so it was kind of disappointing we have to go back talking about racing now. Anyway. Well, look, <laughs> it turns out we've got plenty of great stuff to talk about. Tom Malone, how are you? Excitement levels yesterday. I was critical of the lads and their low-key start, but Honeysuckle blew everything away, right? Yeah, absolutely. She was absolutely magnificent. The two of them were brilliant, weren't they? Honeysuckle and Rachel Blackmore, and it just did... Just a side... I mean, this... This show has always been, I suppose, enough. The ball generally has been in real danger of becoming an official honeysuckle stand account for quite some time now. So, you know, we we can safely say we've been on this boat since Christmas at least. So, uh, it was really good to see that kind of performance uh, at, yesterday. I was making the point after that uh, race at Christmas that it was one of those things that everybody needs a bandwagon. Everybody needs to get on because if she can do in Cheltenham what she did in Leopardstown, it would be a truly great Irish sporting performance where it was just the decimation of the field, this kind of changing of the gears. And that's exactly what happened. Yeah, absolutely. It was a phenomenal turn of foot. And, you know, it's kind of incredible just the level of... It's difficult to know if it's improvement, but, I mean, there was times last year when people were saying, oh, oh it was just because of the brilliance of Rachel Blackmore's ride that she beat Benny Dejeu in the mares. And, Obviously now she's won 11 from 11 and she really slayed that champion hurdle field yesterday. And I suppose it's the way she's ridden as well. It's that aggressive manner where she just picks it up three, four furlongs out and really hits the line hard. And that's really exciting too, you know. And you just hope that, um, you know, it, look, it's on the front pages of all the papers and rightly so. Rachel Blackmore, what an incredible uh, performance by her, what an achievement by her, the first woman to win a, a Cheltenham Championship race. But uh, it was just, like, it was just so dominant. That's, I think, what was the best thing about it. There's no caveat, there's no fluke, there's no, there's no real excuses. I mean, any mistakes that were made were probably, mis apart from Gosh, I mean, he's ahead the ball, but like any mistakes that were made were made because of the pressure that Honeysuckle was putting on the field. And uh, yeah, I just thought it was an absolutely incredible performance. Let's hear Rachel Blackmore talking through the race with Joe Malloy and John last night. Did it go to plan? Was it the type of race you expected? Did you do what you were planning to do? Yeah, I'd always planned to line up uh, where I did and keep my options open. And I was hoping that, you know, the field wouldn't congest and I'd be pushed too wide. But it didn't. I was able to slot in one off the rail down the back. Was happy. was happy where I was. And... Uh, yeah, look, the way she, uh, the way she, in the manner in which she finished, um, you know, I could have rode her a few different ways, I'd say. Yeah, that looked like, uh, you know, slotted into six gear and cruise home. I mean, what a, what a way to win. Oh, incredible. <laughs> um, you know, she's, uh, she's an unbelievable engine to have on the uh, When you turn on your phone, who do you call first? Um, I rang... Peter Maloney, uh, Kenny Alexander, um, my parents, um, they were they were top of the list. When so, was, give us the what was the word from the parents? Was it screams down the phone, or are they are they a bit more reserved, or what was coming up from the, the phone line from Tipperary? Uh, they were just delighted. Um, you know, I I get a massive kick out of it, but you know they they get a massive one as well. So actually, they're they're just so pleased. Um, you know, the, the general consensus from everyone was probably. Uh, a bit of sadness that they couldn't be here. Um, you know, delighted, but uh, 
you know, that's just the way things are, unfortunately, this year. And uh, we're all all very grateful to the massive work that everyone's put in in, in getting Cheltenham on and getting us Irish over there. And, you know, we're, we're you know, there's very strict protocols that we have to adhere to. Um, you know, I'm currently eating my uh, eating my dinner inside my room here, um, inside in the, in the Irish bubble. But uh, yeah, we're we're very grateful to all the work that's gone into getting us here. And your parents, I presume, they've been you know so supportive all the way. Did they have misgivings about you getting into this uh, world? And I don't even mean because um, you're female. I just mean because it's such a bloody tough world, son or daughter. It's not an easy mm. road. Have they been kind of pushing you along all the way when you've had the odd doubt here or there, or were they even maybe had a few doubts themselves? No, they've been nothing but supportive. I think they've kind of left it up to me. Like I, you know, I, I uh, after my leaving cert, I, I did college and I got that done. And you know, this uh, this kind of fell my way then. And uh, um, you know, uh, yeah, look, they've been extremely supportive. Um, and you know, as I say, getting as much a kick out of it as anyone. Yeah, great stuff from Rachel Blackmore last night speaking with Joe and John Duggan. Johnny Ward, she's now a bona fide Irish sports star and is in the vanguard of the new generation of Irish jockeys who've taken over from that all-time great coterie that we were like, oh, they're never going to be replaced. But it turns out, uh, you know, time waits for, for no man or woman. Yeah, um, you know, I think she's probably a little bit of a reluctant um, ambassador for equality in sport, but it's fantastic that we have this story in racing. I, I still think it's one of the things that racing just does not sell itself well enough. I think there should be, you know, posters, billboards um, of Rachel Blackmore, like all over Dublin when racing is on a big big meeting at Leopard Sound and so forth. Um, I think we need to really promote the fact that Rachel Blackmore Ryan Frost and obviously Holly Doyle, what she's doing in Britain, um, is fantastic for our sport. Um, you know, in racing, people don't really go on about women fighting for equality, um, young girls trying to get into the game because we essentially have a staff 50-50 um, basis in terms of male versus female in racing. And um, I don't think there's a sport like it where it really doesn't matter what your gender is. And what Rachel has done is absolutely phenomenal. It, it's, 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 it's one thing that she's obviously a lady rider, but the other thing is that she was basically going nowhere as an amateur uh, when she became a professional. And I don't think anyone would have envisaged she would have had such a career that she's had. And um, it's been marvellous to watch her progress as a jockey as well because she now rides these horses with so much confidence. And I think... Henry de Bromhead is, is key to this story as well because Henry de Bromhead's horses never seem to be out of form. Um, they're incredibly adept at doing the job that they're um, you know trained to do. They jump really well. They're very fit. They travel well. They're uncomplicated. And uh, I thought Rachel was brilliant to watch yesterday. She had so much confidence in the horse. You remember 12 months ago where Paul Townend got a bit of a grilling afterwards, I think, in the media because of his ride on Benny Diadu and the way Rachel uh, rode Honeysuckle coming up the inner there around the final bend. I kind of thought last year that Henry... Uh, that Honeysuckle was just a better horse, but that was a brilliant ride. This was kind of just take the um, possibilities of failure out of it and just be confident in the mare. And it was an incredible performance from Honeysuckle. I, I, I just she continues to blow me away. But Rachel is an ambassador for our sport that we need to promote a lot more. Okay, let's move on because there's loads of other stuff. Like uh, Jack Kennedy probably doesn't get the praise in today's papers because of what happened with Rachel, but the the win on Black Tears was fairly sensational, Tom Malone, uh, like at the very last second. And he was totes to motion afterwards as well, because obviously that yard has been through such a difficult time over the last while. Yeah, it was kind of incredible to see Jack Kennedy. Like Jack Kennedy is is a, is a one word answer man generally. You know what I mean? He definitely doesn't say too much. He doesn't say too much before a race. He says even less afterwards sometimes. And he was, yeah. You could see the pressure lifted on him just afterwards. And what a ride. And you talk about the, the quality in the Irish way room as well. I mean, it's hard to believe that Jack Kennedy's only, what, 21 years of age. Um, he's had horrific injuries as well so far in his very short career. And uh, Black Tears was, I mean, obviously, look, the ride on for Rachel Blackmore and Honeysuckle is the one that's gained the headlines. But the, the ride in Black Tears is absolutely sensational. Uh, tracked concertista. And I would say that. He was quite confident actually in the closing stages because he just had his horse full of momentum in that final furlong and the hill can be your friend as well it's a bit like the the sort of touchline being a, a defender that never misses a tackle in rugby that hill can just be such a friend for a staying on horse when you've got one out in front of you because you know he's going to slow down and uh you know concertista is absolutely nabbed on the line 
Not a great result for many punches, by the way. And I'm sure Paddy Power, uh, when he comes on a little later on, will be very pleased about the ride that Jack Kennedy gave, uh, gave Jack to his rocks. It saved him a fortune. It was um, the two rides Jack gave the two horses yesterday were like, I think if you ask a jockey to go through it in terms of an analysis or get one of the grave riders of uh, yesteryear like Ruby or Garrity on, they will just say the two rides he gave um, Galvin and Black Tears were absolutely perfect. I mean, if you ran that race against Concertista again, I'm not many, I'm not sure how many times Black Tears would win the race. His tactics, everything he did were absolutely perfect. For a guy who's had like four leg breaks or whatever it is already in his early 20s, yesterday was a day of delivery and it was just unfortunate for him although I don't think he care that Rachel hogged the headlines yeah no it definitely isn't something that he would seem to care about too much and even when he was asked about later on in the week it was like look there's a lot of a lot of uh, rides to be done between now and the Gold Cup and I ain't talking about that until after I've got that one. 0879-180-180 is the WhatsApp number if you've got any questions for us or any tips for us indeed and we'll put them to the lads we'll uh, see if uh, their ideas match up with yours or, of course, you can always leave a comment for us on the YouTube stream. This is the Cheltenham Show on OTV Sports with Paddy Power. Don't feel like a punter. Feel like a favourite, this Cheltenham. We're here every day from half past ten to half past eleven uh, going through the cards. Um, Tom, your trifecta yesterday, how did you get on? Uh, first, second and third, so not great. Um, yeah, we, we, we need to do a little bit better. An each way trifecta better, might have been so the way to way. do that. Or, I don't know, what are they yeah, called? Yeah, very skinny, though. Is, is, but, is that a super yeah, the, uh, Dixie, Trixie, Mixie? Each each way Trixie, and each way Trixie or each way Patent. Uh, yeah, no, we, we could we could have gone with that. Anyway, we have we have more today uh, if we, if we want to go with that. Just one thing as well. Great, another great moment yesterday. Sean Flanagan. Obviously, we had a little piece with him earlier on in the year where he had a, a focus on his day in the life of a jockey. So great, he actually had his first Cheltenham winner yesterday on board that eighty to one winner, yeah. Jeff Kidder. Uh, for no me too, so that was a lovely moment. And they were saying he'd flown himself over in his plane and everything. So uh, that's like <laughs> uh, any other yeah, day. No, of, it was any other day of the year. That's like, hang on a second. That jockey flew himself over and has just won an eighty to one shot. This is ridiculous. But um, you know, uh, we've only got so much room on the show. We should have done a bit more on that. We will probably uh, talk to him in the in the coming weeks about that because it's. Um, he said it was his third winner ever in England. It's like, well, that's not bad. Uh, haven't won at the festival. He, yeah, so it was. I was really, really nice. And look, it's kind of one of those guys, Sean Flanagan. You just someone you would never think that was his first child, the winner, because he's so experienced and he's had plenty of big race winners uh, in Ireland. Obviously, been part of the furniture with Noel Mead since the retirement uh, of uh, of Paul Carberry as well. So, just one of the absolute good guys of Irish race, and just delighted for him that um, that he was able to get get a winner at, at Cheltenham. Absolutely. Just one point, Johnny. You did make the point yesterday. Um, if you if you triple up the three short price favourites, the odds on favourites yesterday into a treble, uh, you might get some value and that was obviously the case as we saw the the big favourites bolting up in the races that they were supposed to win. So um, not a bit a bad bit of advice uh, from Johnny Warren in yesterday's show. Except Concertista didn't. No, but you, you didn't include Concertista, did you? I didn't, I didn't. Um, you know, you can still kind of get involved in this as well. If you back on Watelain and Monkfish, at the moment, you're getting comfortably north of even money on the double. I would be amazed, genuinely, absolutely amazed if either were beaten. So if you haven't had a bet and you want to double your money um, over the course of the next, what, 28 hours or so, that's not the worst option. Yes, yeah, small, small amounts, obviously. Uh, Tom, your trifecta, please. Yeah, my trifecta for today. Look, there's an obvious travel you could go with, and that sort of um, Shaq and Poursois, Easy Sland, and uh, maybe... Some would throw in either, you know, the bumper, the favourite in the bumper, Kilcruz or um, or Bob Ollinger. But anyway, I am not going to do that. And I'm actually against Bob Ollinger. I noticed he's drifted slightly, but he was ludicrously short last night. Um, I'm with Brave Man's Game in the opening race of the day, the Ballymore Ballymore Alvin Turtle at 120. Uh, Paul Nichols has him down as his best chance of the week. The next destination was just touched off yesterday. So first leg is Brave Man's Game. Uh, I'm sticking with one favourite, though. That will be um, Shaq and Poursois in the Queen Mother Champion Chase. And then also I'm going to go to the Coral Cup for my other winner of the afternoon. And uh, I'm hopeful that the Jake McManus domination of handicap hurdles at Cheltenham continues. And I'm going to stick with Blue Sari, who was actually placed in the champion bumper a couple of years ago. So it's uh, Brave Man's Game in the Ballymore at 120, Blue Sari in the Coral Cup at 230, and the sort of anchor leg. Uh, the good thing is, of course, Shaq and Pursuit. I'm slightly surprised how big a prize Shaq and Pursuit is in the, in the champion chase. Okay, so hang on, I can't find Blue Sari. Blue Sari is 10 to 1. 
Is that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. It was actually 16s yesterday. Okay. Yeah. So this is a 98 um, to 1 trifecta. Ah, uh, yeah. All right. <laughs> Jesus, Tom. Yeah, we're only going to play it small stakes, Joe. We're only going to play I, it small stakes. I'll so stick my 10 cents on that stakes? happily. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, look, there's a, there's a few others. There's a, there's a couple of others. I actually went went through the card and uh, my homeschooling has paid dividends as well because look, my son has actually done his selections as well. <laughs> Completely wow. beautiful colors. So uh, there's Milo's selections as well that, that he's come up with. Is he a better uh, tipster than his dad? Uh, well, he certainly, he, he does like, he goes Gaia de Mani, Monkfish, Grand Wa, First Flow, Alpha de Zobo, Duke de Genève and he's with you, John, Kilcrute in the bumper. <laughs> Good man, Milo. <laughs> right. Good stuff, Thomas. Is there anything else you want to talk about? A quick thought on Tiger Roll? Uh, the, the, yeah, Tiger Roll. I mean, I, I would like to put Easy's Land in a treble, but I just can't not cheer on Tiger Roll. Um, obviously, look, the stable, we know all about the controversy of the stable, but like Keith, uh, Keith, Dun Keith Dunahue lives just down the road from me here, and uh, I would just absolutely love to see him and Tiger Roll bounce back to a bit of form. And, you know, it could be the last time we see him as well. He's not going to run the Grand National. He may be retired on the spot. You wouldn't know. But, uh, look, Tiger Roll to regain the cross-country, uh, to get regain his cross-country crown. He's he's up against it with Easy Slant who holds him on last year's form. But that ground is drying out. And, uh, you know, we've, we've written this horse off many times before. So I'd love to see Tiger Roll in the cross-country. OK. All right, well, we'll talk a bit more about Tiger Roll in a moment. Uh, good stuff, Tom Malone. Thanks very much for joining us. Tom's Trifecta is available on otbsports.com and, of course, on the uh, OTB Sports app. And we'll, um, we'll uh, check in with it tomorrow. Um, Johnny, when you're looking at a day like today and there's um, so many different stories in each individual race, uh, what's your approach? What, what is your recommendation for people who are uh, casual punters who are looking to get involved in today? You, you've obviously a complete and utter contrast here. So you've Shaq and Porcelain and Monkfish, um, who are both odds on. Monkfish could go off four to one on or something like that. Be one of the shortest um, price horses actually in in um, the festival in recent years. And then you have races like obviously the 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 the, uh, the two handicaps much much more open. So it's kind of um, I guess it's it's what your taste is. Do you want to get involved in these short prices? I think Cheltenham for, personally for me anyway. When I got into Cheltenham initially, um, which would have been around about 2003 I like backing horses I liked having a fiver each way in horses and if you had a big price winner um, that was the year that Barry Garrity the five timer for some reason I, I backed a lot of Barry Garrity's horses um, and I was hooked on Cheltenham ever since I think it's better crack to have a fiver each way if you're getting into Cheltenham on a 14 to 1 shot and um, you know look at the for, for example in the um, the Coral Cup that was mentioned there I think Paddy Power is, pay, is paying seven places in that race. So if you want to have a bet in that race, so 26 runners. So I've, um, Tom has tipped up Lou Sari. I've gotten a bit of word for Birchdale, who's also JP McManus. Um, I think he's like 12 or 14 to 1 with Paddy Power. But if you finish in the first seven, um, you, you get a profit. So like that gives you great interest throughout the race as well. So that's kind of the way I'd be looking at it if you are kind of a once a year or a first time in a lifetime punter. So sorry, just go back to that. The, um, the Carl Cup is going to post at half past two. And you're saying... Yeah, so Birchdale has been interesting. My tip in that race would be Sneaky Getaway um, for Emma Mullins. Now, we're, we've already discussed three horses here. I think he's very interesting, but Birchdale is a fascinating horse because he's likely raced. He was a very, very good horse at, um, at start for Nicky Henderson, and it looked like he was basically a grade one horse, but he's running a handicap. And just to mention his sire, Jeremy. Jeremy came on the scene when the late Hour Connor trained by the late Desi Hughes came along, and Jeremy's now the late Jeremy as well. They've all passed away. But Jeremy, after the success of O'Connor, was then... And basically sent to a load of national hunt mares and they're finally um, having kind of these horses now that um, have national hunt pedigrees and Jeremy had a brilliant day yesterday with two winners and he could easily have a third one today. Okay, that's interesting because we, we never talk about the breeding really when it comes to national hunt or sorry, not as much as we do. It's not as pronounced as it, uh, as well, it is when it comes to the flat season. Point Punchestown was really interesting on Monday because essentially point to points have been called off because it's deemed um, it's not a lead sport. So the point to point horses have had nowhere to run. So Punchestown and HRI put on um, a meeting of bumpers for point to point horses. And the Racing Post hipsters on the day, if there was there were eight races, I think. They tipped seven of the eight winners, and I think only one of them had ever run before. And three of the winners were sired by Walk in the Park. And Walk in the Park became really popular as a national hunt stallion in this country when a certain Duvan came around and everyone were like, 
what is this stallion? What is this most beautiful horse? Let's send our mare to walk in the park. Well, I think uh, is or was standing at around 10 grand, which is quite expensive. But anyway, after a while then, when you when you put the proper breeding in place for National Hunt horses, so you have a situation on Monday where walk in the park, who wouldn't have had a plethora of bumper horses up until now, has three winners in the one day. And uh, you've Jeremy having two winners uh, yesterday. So eventually, in National Hunt, when a sire becomes popular almost by default, it's several years later that his best horses come around because it does take that long in National Hunt. Obviously, horses don't run to their four. Well, Birchdale's seven as well, so that makes sense. Uh, Paddy Power, yeah. good morning to you. How are you? Great, Jer. How are you getting on? Yeah, not bad. It was kind of a break-even day, I think, for everybody yesterday. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it was kind of a, bit, a bit scary for a while for the bookies, but then, as Cheltenham always does, it swings and roundabouts all week, so I've seen many a year where we've been way behind and then come back or way ahead and then got stuck the last couple of days, so that's kind of... It's it's a it's a it's basically a draw, yeah, I guess, after day one, so... um. Yeah, some good results, some brilliant races. Brilliant. I'm sure you've talked about some brilliant finishes and great fairy tale stories from yesterday, and uh, it hasn't disappointed. No, it kind of had everything. Like uh, we've we've talked a good bit about Rachel today, and she was on the show last night as well. So, and she's, as we've said, she's on the front of all the newspapers. But uh, Jack Kennedy, um, one of those bobbing head finishes that will stand the test of time. And then you have the uh, the Irish jockey for Noel Mead, who's incredibly experienced, who flies himself over in his own plane. It literally had a little bit for everybody. Yeah, exactly. Strong plan again. Yeah, so it was good. I mean, and the, like you said, eighty to one winner, and the, and the, the few hot pots went in as well. So something for everybody. And we've already won the Presbury Cup, according to you guys. I think it's pretty likely. Yeah, to be fair, it's um, yeah. We, we, I'm it, on it, minus it, six, Paddy. What? I'm on minus six, so I'm kind of. I think, like, I think you're yeah, sitting pretty. Yeah. Yeah, it could be like t- 10, or t- 10 or 11, 2 or 3 today, after today. Or t- my, bus, my maths isn't great. 11, 3 maybe after today. Um, I think uh, I think we're, we're looking pretty pretty sweet today as well. But um, yeah, I mean, that was that was always going to happen, though, to be fair. I mean, the, the strength of the Irish shot. And actually, the lack of runners, when you really dig down into it, it's actually the lack of English people, or certain English people, <laughs> English uh, ho- uh, trainers and connections sending their horses there. That's why the fields are a bit smaller, I think. And I think they're just a little bit scared of the Irish lads. OK, well, let's go through some of the uh, the big races today and and, and get into this. Um, Johnny, where do you want to start? Because obviously, um, do we start with Monkfish? Uh, sure, yeah. I, I think this horse is spectacular. Um, get your HGTV uh, on for this race and just admire this horse, how beautiful he is and how effortless it is him jumping a fence. Um, strange things have happened, obviously, Jerry. You know, he's he's 130 on or thereabouts, um, but he's he's utterly spectacular. And um, that's the second race. Obviously, the first race, we could have a potential star here in the shape of Bob Wallinger, Gary Dermanil, or even Brave Man's Game. I think the Irish will win this. Um, but I'm intrigued by Curse Con Risk here, and uh, I think if you if you look into playing him on maybe a three place market or something like that for Joseph Ryan, I think he'll run very well, and I'd be very very confident though the Irish will win the first, and it could be another one for Rachel Blackmore. Okay, so that's actually a, a short enough field in the uh, first race. Goes post twenty past one today. Bob Ollinger's thirteen to eight, Guyer Dumanil two to one, Brave Man's Game four to one, Bear Gills eight to one. Uh, Curse Con Risk, which you like, is um, is fourteen to one, kind of has gone out from uh, 12 to 14 to 16 and back into 14. So obviously the market, not quite sure what to make of that at the moment. Does he know at 50 and optimise prime at 100 to 1? Um, John, any thoughts on this? Um, yeah, so I've gone for Bob Ollinger in my charity bet with Paddy Power. The fact that Ruby and Patrick Mullins are riding today, that they fancy Bob Ollinger should be a tip of itself. And I think one of the best pieces of form was when himself and Fernie Hollow went up the straight at Goran Park earlier this year. Uh, we've seen a pre stage at Frank, the former Fernie Hollow from the bumper last year. Uh, I think it's between the three of them, but I think Bob Ollinger has done nothing wrong under Rachel Blackmore and Henry de Bromhead, and Bob Ollinger is my selection at 13 to 8. Okay. Paddy, any thoughts on this? Yeah, I was kind of sweet on Guyer Domain Hill because um, uh, I just thought the price was bigger. Now, there, there's a Bob Ollinger definitely has to be favoured, and it, they're quite close together in price now, 13 to 8 and 2 to 1. I thought Guyer Domain Hill might be a bit bigger, might be almost 3 to 1. I'm going to stick to my guns with him, but I do think if Bob Bollinger was anyway, it got a tiny bit bigger, I'd nearly be changing my mind. But I, I agree with Johnny about Kesk on risk, and it's just a shame there's only seven runners because I'd love to be back in Kesk on risk each way. But you really, with the three horses, Brave Man's Game, Bob Bollinger, and um, Guy or Domain Hill looking to be the obvious top three in the market, you need one of them to underperform. And two of them to underperform, I think, is too much. But Kesk on risk possibly has one to, f- to finish second and hopefully to Guy or Domain Hill. Okay, so that's the first race. The second race of the day is obviously we've talked a little bit about monkfish. Is there anything, Paddy, that you see that's a, a threat to monkfish other than uh, his own jumping? No, it's very hard to see it. I mean, 
like maybe if the ground is very get very fast or something like that. I mean, the, the fences are obviously a threat, but he's so big and he nearly steps over them, you know. Um, but he's very short odds, and that's fine. And you know what? You don't have to have a bet in every race. So you just sit back and watch it. If you want to really, if you really want to have have an interest, it's like something without. I mean, maybe like oh, maybe sporting John, but I but I'd look I'd look to be honest, just watch Monkfish and enjoy because he'd probably be watching him again next year, winning the Gold Cup, you know. Yeah, but that's where I got here, John. Do you have any thoughts on Monkfish? I love Monkfish. One of the, the best races I saw last year was the one he won, the Novice Hurdle, and I'm just blown away by him over fences. Uh, Katie was also saying on the show last Saturday that he's actually filled out. He's, a, he's an improving scoping chaser. He jumps beautifully. He's got a lovely cruising speed. I'll be disappointing for the sport if Monkfish doesn't win or something. Uh, there's a mishap there today. Um, to me, he's a, he's a banker, and I'll put him in a double with Shaq and Persuade in the main one. OK, the other big race today is the Queen Mother Champion Chase, so we'll skip forward to that and uh, we can come back to some of the other ones. Um, so the Queen Mother Champion Chase goes to post at five past three and Chacan Poursois is obviously odds-on favourite here. Put the kettle on 17 to two, Politolog 9 to one, Nuba Negra 11 to one, So Royale 12 to one, Cielos Emery at 14 to one, first flow 16, and then after that you're looking at the big prices. So, Johnny, what is the threat to Chacan Poursois? Probably the hill. Um, he hasn't run at Cheltenham before. He was going to run last year. Um, this, the last year's race ended up being a, a real flop for me um, because uh, Deputy Desoy ran a stinker and obviously Altior was scratched and Shaq Persuade was scratched, so it became a nothing race. This year he actually has made it over and, and he's going to um, run and hopefully justify odds on favouritism. Um, I, I'm still slightly in two minds about him. I really liked Altior each way. I thought he was going to come to hand and he was my play in the race. Um, and I think Shaq and Corsois should win. I, I just, for some reason, I just have a nagging doubt about him getting up the hill. He's very he's brilliant at his fences. Um, and I think with the drying ground, I think So Royale is going to run very well. Um, obviously, he was brilliant the last day beating Champ uh, in games for Newbury. He's run well in this race before. He's had Altior off the bridle. And um, the ground is drying out. I think he's going to run well. And look out for... Paddy Powers betting without markets and betting each way markets here if you want to take on the favourites. Um, I'm just slightly in two minds about Shaq and Bursaw getting up the hill. And I was talking to Eddie O'Leary um, for a racing TV podcast the other day and he's, he's very, very doubtful about him getting up the hill as well. So time will reveal all. That's interesting, isn't it? That there is doubt, so much, and not so much doubt, but a little bit of might nagging be based doubt. On... Which? It, it might not be based on much, but I, I've watched him at Leopardstown and he doesn't really, he doesn't, power home at the end of his race that's at Leopardstown this is this is going to be a test and test until if he has somebody challenge him at the last if he's not if the race isn't won at the last I'm worried there's always one of the odds on favourites turned over across the week Paddy that's my uh, that's my old wives tale that's in me it's in me waters um, and I have no idea why but uh, like is this the one uh, it might be. I mean, it might be. I mean, yesterday I mean, it wasn't odds on, but Concertista was the one that got chinned and only just chinned. But um, I think it, on the book, like Shaq and Persuade probably should win. And Shaq and Persuade could be brilliant. But everything Johnny says is fair that, you know, because we haven't seen him do it at Cheltenham before, that's the one reason why he's four to five and not four to seven or whatever. You know, I think um, it's a decent race in behind, but. You know, there's doubts about almost everything, or you know, everything like first flow is is possibly one that's still, you know, still improving. Beat uh, one that be uh, beat Politolog last time out, one that the Tingle Creek, which is good as a big price. Um, not one I particularly fancy though on the better ground. I think for me, the really good value is put the kettle on because it won the Arca last year. It's won at Cheltenham twice, and a real kind of course specialist, and was stuffed now behind Shag. Part of this makes no sense because it was stuffed at Leopardstown behind Shag and Bersuad. The race at Leopard's Ranch should really have not have suited put the kettle on. I would, wouldn't have liked the track as much as he likes Cheltenham if there are doubts about Shaq and Persuade coming up the hill. And, you know, maybe there are, maybe there aren't. They're, they're not really based on anything other than a hunch because we haven't seen him before. But uh, I think put the kettle on will love the hill and has shown before that he loves the hill and uh, or she loves the hill. And I think will be there or thereabouts. And for an each way bet, I think is absolutely rock solid. It jumps for fun and loves the track. Come in from 10 to 1 to 17 to 2 at the moment. Um, John Duggan, any thoughts on the, the Queen Mother Champion Chase? Um, I'm quite strong on Shaq and Brissois. His best ever run was on better, the best ground he ever encountered. That was a punch of town a couple of years ago where he absolutely murdered Jeffy Desai and the recent Arca winner, Duke de Genevra. It was a breathtaking performance. Um, won a Christmas nicely, but then his last performance was even better. And it's interesting that Paul Townend usually rides him out in front and, and gains lengths with him with the jumping and then the, the cruising speed puts uh, other horses into trouble. 
but actually he produced them late and then he, he, he bounded them up the hill. I just think he's better than these. And I think the, the better ground will suit him. Ruby's been talking about that as well. I'd agree with uh, Paddy that put the kettle on as the horse I'd like to see as the next best. Last year's race was a joke, Little Oak, uh, although there's money for it this morning. Um, notebook doesn't, the course doesn't suit first flow. And Nuba Negra are flat track bullies for me. So yes, Emery's never really run that well at Cheltenham. Shackon for a swat for me is... Is, is bomb proof. He's rock solid. I actually think he's a good price. If you want to take a horse on at odds on, it's Easy's Land in that cross country race. Shaka Brassois to me has got a much better chance than Easy's Land. And I put Shaka Brassois in my charity bet in a double with Monkfish. Okay. All right. We're so. near um, data in terms of Jura, like what we could do with racing in terms of data about horses going around the field, what distance do they cover, how fast they went in sections and all that. I would love to get that on jumping the fence and how efficient Shaka Brassois is, how quick he is for me to be. Because I don't know. I don't know if I've ever seen a horse jump as fast as him. This is a spectacular, spectacular sight. If you don't have a bet in the race, just watch him at a fence. He is unbelievably quick. Okay, so uh, Chacan Bourgeois, I'm, I'm feeling uh, from you guys, is not the one that's going to be overturned this week. Uh, let's talk about the, the Carl Cup. Um, one of the other bits of information that I think the casual punters who are watching the show and kind of uh, getting into Cheltenham for the first time, Johnny, is that um, when you were talking earlier on about a JP horse, he likes to have horses in these races. That's one of those kind of um, Cheltenham hoary old cliches at this stage because it's true. Oh, yeah, like it's, it's, Cheltenham is, you know, you, you got to go there to understand it, you know, and I don't care what anyone says, no, no race we can compare to Cheltenham. Um, well, I mean, specifically even, these big handicaps, though, that JP likes horses in these races. Yeah, he, well, he, in fairness, he's paying, um, paying a lot of money in training fees, paying a lot of money to buy these horses in the first place, and he wants, he wants winners primarily on the big day, so, um, there's nothing wrong with a trainer training a horse like Birchdale in theory to peak on a day like this when he could go from one in a Kempton bumper, um, to basically win at Cheltenham. He's, he wasn't primed essentially to win a Kempton bumper. That's not why he's in training. He's in training to provide his, uh, you know, owner with a chance to win the race at, at Cheltenham. That's why JP has all these runners, and, it's also kind of like um, you could have 20 horses in a race and you could have 20 different bets because these horses, they're all primed for Cheltenham. And you can take on Willie Mullins in the bumper, we'll say, and back a horse like his, his uh, cool gen is 50 to 1. That horse could completely outrun his odds. And it's the same in these races. If JP has four or five, there's nothing to say his fourth or fifth string, according to the betting, won't win. And it's all per personal preference. Maybe you like the name, uh, maybe you like the jockey, maybe you like the trainer, maybe you like the the, uh, the fact that the horse is, is just coming to hand. All of these things. Um, so it's each to their own, and that's what I love about Cheltenham. So many angles into it. But JP loves winners of Cheltenham, as would anyone. So Sneaky Getaway, was that the one that you liked? Yeah, I like Sneaky Getaway. Emma Mullins, 44% strike rate in Britain uh, with his jumpers. Probably not enough written about that, how phenomenal that is that's for a young bad. trainer. <laughs> it's not bad. Um, it just starts very, very good in the flat. Been a little bit hit and miss over hurling so far, but uh, again, like, like Birchdale, he comes here after running the all-weather. I think he's primed. Paddy, any thoughts on, on the Carl Cup? Yeah, there's a couple in here I like. I think you're 100% right to point out the JP factor. Last year, he won, it felt like he won every handicap hurdle. He, he seemed to win loads of them. And uh, so I think his horses will, will obviously be made, very much targeted at this. Now, he's a couple in the race, but I think Birchdale is the one I'd be uh, I'd be keen on. There's been a few quid around for this morning. I just see a couple of kind of people that should, like, it's just been tipped up nicely by people that might have heard a whisper over there, you know, and I think at about 12 to 1, Birchdale has got a decent chance. But the one I picked out myself, like, bearing in mind all this got shady stuff that this horse has been laid out and everything, but I picked out myself is, is Botox Ha for uh, for Gary much <laughs> more. It's about a 14 to 1 shot. And I just think this one might be a change of look for the Moors after um, Gosh and Ram. It's so, so weird. Power on the yeah, Botox. The what? Paddy Power on the Botox. That's me. Botox has. Has I? No, I don't think so. <laughs> That's a very, very... Uh, just looking at your forehead there, Paddy. Not a crease on it. Well preserved. Are you, are you sure? Are you sure you're looking at the right one? <laughs> so I moisturise daily, Jared. That must be it. Uh, John Duggan, anything in this? My each way tip in this race is Botox has. 14 to 1. Okay, right. Yeah, yeah. See when the when when the great powers and the great minds converge, well then you've got to take an interest. Uh, okay, so that's the Carl Cup. We've talked about the Queen Mother Champion Chase, the the cross country, and obviously uh, Tiger Roll running in the cross country. Uh, uh, is this the last time we see Tiger Roll? Like, is this? Where yeah. are we with this? Yeah, you think so, John? I think so. Yeah, I think so. 
Um, I don't like this race. I think this is a race where you, it's into the developing room, the photography room. It's a dark, uh, dark room, and you, you come out and you, you find out it's won. I wish they'd run him in the Grand National, um, I, I, you know, but they decided not to. So um, I think this is the this is the swan song, and, and it could be just quiet, and they just could decide and may, may, might might do an interview, might not, but that he'll retire after this. Because where else is he going to go? Is he going to go back for this next year? No, I think I think this is it. Yeah, Johnny Wards. Um, he's 11, and that's not ridiculously old. So I could see him in training next year. I think it's absolutely absurd that he's not winning the Grand National. I think it was um, used at the time as a kind of a means to maybe pour a bit of uh, cold water on the whole Gordon Elliott hysteria. Because remember, Tiger Woods was with the National in the middle of the Gordon Elliott um, Morgan mess. Um, I thought it was a nonsense, really, about his way, to be honest. Um, I just hope the horse gets around in one piece. I couldn't, uh, I'm not going to lie, I have no idea if this horse retains the ability or the ability that he had last year, but I would slightly agree with Eddie O'Leary in the fact that I thought his run at Navin was more promising, maybe, than people said afterwards, and the superficial detail on paper of what he actually achieved. I thought he travelled well, um, and yeah, if he's bang there at the last, I'll be cheering him on today, but um, he should be running the National. Uh, yeah, I think everybody would uh, at this stage agree with that. Paddy, the, the history of the horse is that um, it gets uh, horribly underrated on seasonal return and romps home at like 33 to 1. Or Was there a 50 to 1 winner somewhere along the way, even after it had already won at Cheltenham? I remember the seasonal return. Ah, don't worry about it. And yet this time it feels like it's right to be writing him off that it's just the other side of greatness at this point. I think like like us all, I love a bit of sun in his back. It, it comes comes to life in the spring and always runs better in the spring and has done the whole way through his career. But I think um, I, he's a, he, I, it's very unlikely he's improving. He's 11, right? So um, you got you got to think he's probably not going to be as good as he was a couple of years ago when he ramped up in this. He got beat last year fair and square by Easy's Land. Um, I think Easy's Land has to be a short price favourite. Tiger Roll, you're taking a lot on trust, a lot on the fairy tale factor. I wouldn't be fancying it today, to be honest. Easy's Land don't particularly like either because I think the ground will have dried out, particularly in the middle of the track where the cross country is. And I think that's a worry for the favourite. And I think it's just an open race. And these races, you, you want to go for horses that love the course and love the track. And I've just ruled out two of them. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go, I, I'm going to go at a, at a big, big price for a horse that got beaten a short head in a cross country race here at Cheltenham uh, earlier in the season. Defi de Car, uh, French horse number four uh, for Charlie Mann and Harry Bannister. It's about a 20 to one shot. There might even be bigger out there. I wouldn't begrudge you if you went and took the 28s or 25s around. I think that one is an each way squeak because it likes to track and knows its way around. A bit of money for that as well. Well, in from 30s, um, Defi de Car, and uh, look, uh, th you tune into this race, and it tends to be won by one horse by 25 lengths. You're like, how the hell did that happen? And then, um, I, I no, it's just very difficult, I think, because it's such a random sequence of uh, there aren't very many markers for it, I, I suppose, is the, the roundabout point I'm trying to make is that you can't point to a very similar race at Leopardstown six weeks ago where they were all in the same race and go, oh, yeah, I can see exactly what's going to happen here. The, the, one of the things about it is don't back horses that don't have any experience at these cross-country fences. You can rule them out pretty much straight away. This was a race that Enda Bulger used to farm. But don't back any horses in this that have no experience of the track. Uh, you want to be on the side of horses that have had a, had a run here. Okay, do you have a, a selection? No, I, I really don't fancy Easy's Land. Like, Easy's Land is a horse now. If I was laying today, I'd lay Easy Land. I'd take it on. I think he's way too short. And um, I, I don't fancy him at all. I think I think Paddy's pick is interesting. And there's money for him and there's money for some neck, which would be a great story. The, you, a small Kildare trainer, uh, John McConnell. And uh, Lebroy, there's money for that as well. But I don't like this race. And the thing about it is, guys, you don't have to back in every race. Some neck named for um, Aaron McGregor, was it? That's the <laughs> uh, last couple of races, obviously, to talk about here that we haven't spoken about. We've done the cross country. The big handicap at 4.15. I'm just looking at the prices here. And embittered... Uh, is the favourite at the moment nine to two? Zanza is seven to one, and Tukas is seven to one. Chosen mate eight to one, and then it's uh, Ibleo at nines, and then after that you've got Sky Pirate and a bunch of others at twelve and more. So, again, Johnny, there's um, some interesting JP McManus. Uh, what there's a one interesting JP McManus here with Joseph O'Brien and and Tukas. What do you what do you make of Antukas' hopes? Well, I was talking to a uh, bookmaker representative the other day and he's like we've laid three horses in this race we've laid in two casts we've laid in bitter then we've laid us and them and it's like they're they're all trained by the one man like what's going on here i mean they can't all win we're gonna have a triple dead heat of us for Ryan train horses um 
I like in, in two cast here. Personally, I'm not a big fan of really competitive handicap chases. I think um, they're just very difficult. These horses don't have anything in hand at the handicapper in general, and it's a lot about like what horse gets into a good rhythm and look on the day and so forth. Um, so you can obviously back him better than you know, say that he's quite inexperienced. Um, but on the flip side, he might have something in hand, whereas as much as on Tuca, still hasn't actually won over fences. He's very, very solid, and his jumping was better at Leopardstown last day. So I'd be with the Tuca. For me, this is a small bet race, if, if you're having a bet at all. Yeah, Paddy? Yeah, funny, the Grand Annual, is, it's a it's a stranger because it's been run on uh, the the old course, rather. Sorry, the, obviously the first couple of days, and it used to be later in the week on the other course, on the, the new course, which is a much longer straight which meant that the horses have much more time to come from the back and you saw a lot more kind of closers if you like win it and uh, and this year i think the horse that'll be rid prominent rid rid jesus ridden prominently will be uh will be the ones that will be, be fighting out of the finish it's gonna be hard to come from very far back in a big field uh and Tukas definitely is one i'd have on my short list that johnny mentioned but the one i'm going for a big price is on the slopes for chris gordon and tom cannon so an 18 to one shot john's about to eat his hat he's obviously going to go for the same one as well but uh i think on the slopes is one that has some decent form there behind simply the bets there's some decent track form where he's been there or thereabouts and one that can be ridden prominently and if you gets a good position earlier or early in the race he could be a uh, we there thereabouts to finish kind of like two countdown nerds you've got like a an, an eight words an eight word that nobody's ever thought of and they have to guys tip off to each other yeah that was me as well <laughs> yeah i've also picked on the slopes uh two handicap races no idea no comparison to those beforehand and we both picked the same course twice so if that's not a sign listeners uh, on st patrick's day and viewers then i don't know what is it's a 284 to 1 double on the slopes and Botox has. Uh, Botox has. Uh, so there you go. If that, if that comes off, it's going to be a good week for all of us. Uh, right, and then the last race is obviously the champion bumper. Um, you're, you're hot for Kilcrute, John. You, you like the Mullins horse and the bumper. Um, and you've seen enough to suggest that there's progression coming. Sure, you, I, Paddy, Johnny, we could all sit on Kilcrute and win. On the basis of what happened the last day at Leopardstown, it was absolutely, absolutely uh, not. That's absolute nonsense, Sean. Like if I absolutely sat on that ridiculous. Horse, if I if I sat on that horse, like what would what? I mean, it would be a car crash in every level. Um, and and uh, Johnny, I, I, it's, it, it, I'd be doing the weight on him relatively. Jo jo Johnny, it's uh, it wasn't that literally. <laughs> um, Your confidence so, is endearing. It is. Um, it's honeysuckle confidence uh, from yesterday um, until next destination got shinned. Uh, so Kilcrush, look, I was so impressed by him the last day. The key thing about it is Paul Tennant had the choice of Sir Gerhardt, he had the choice of um, the Ramillas, um, and, he, and, he, and he's chosen to, to ride Kilcrush. Patrick Mullen's very sweet in him. I've heard good word about him. Like, even at Navin the time before, when he had to roust him a bit, he, he stayed on well up that hill at Navin. And look, it is a bumper, but Willie has farmed this race for 20 years, and I, I really think Kilcrush will do the job today. Look, I don't think I, you've probably seen more from Monkfish, you've seen more from Shaka Perswat, you've more evidence of these horses, but I do like Kilcrush at odds against. I've gone for him. Okay, he's around about 11 to 8 at the moment, Paddy. Yeah, I'm actually a tiny bit surprised that Sir Gerhard isn't favourite. Um, I know he's moved stables, and I guess I think Bally Adam ran pretty well in the Supreme yesterday. So he, like, as, as, an, as an idea like, as to whether the horses that moved stables are, are, have, have been infected by it, yeah. but. Uh, I thought Sir Gerhardt might shorten up a bit, a little bit. I think the the you know the, the word on the street from I have no idea who's no idea if it's true or not, but the word is that Sir Gerhardt is the second best stable in that yard, yeah. uh, in Denise Foster's yard now after Andy uh, Allen, uh, who's yeah. obviously a wonder horse. So Gerhardt is very very good. But I'm actually I'm, like, interesting. Ruby Ruby Watts has tipped up Ramillies. Barry Garrity on the telly last night tipped up Ramillies. I think there might be something that Leopards Ten race that Kilcrush absolutely hosed up in. Um, you know, they say it was a weird, uh, funny old race. Now, he did absolutely hose. We nearly lapped them. But uh, the Ramillies was in that race and kind of ran a bit weird. But Ramillies is 12 to 1. Some people who know way more than me are tipping up at 12 to 1. So maybe that's worth an each way look. But I do actually genuinely think that Kilcrut will be the better horse long term. But I think at this stage, Sir Gerhardt could beat Kilcrut. OK, so there's, there's definitely competition there in this one, Johnny, because, you know, Yesterday, for example, those three winners that we talked about earlier on bolting up, this is unlikely to be such a, a clear cut win. It's hard to know, you know, we could we could have a star here in one of the two Mullins runners, you know, they really could be excellent. Cast Dyn Dine Mine back to twelve months ago. So there we are in the Cheltenham press room, the big Cheltenham press room, 
and John Duggan and I have a moment after both of us backed on Bois Alain, which seemed like at least my first winner of the day, if not the first two days. And we had a, a moment. We didn't embrace because even then we were conscious, I think, of social distancing or maybe we're, that's just the way we are. But uh, we, we knew Fernie Hollow was a good horse 12 months ago and the same connections now have Sir Gerhard, whose stable mate Kilcrew probably has the best form. But the two of them do look like potential stars. And... Um, I'm going to have a shot in the dark at Cool Jet here, 50 to 1 or so for Willie Mullins, because back on the last day, he drifted like a barge of Thurlis, but he won as he liked. His stallion is absolutely flying it at the moment. Can't really see why Willie's bringing him over unless he thinks he'll run a reasonable race. No point having a winner at Cheltenham. No point bringing a horse to Cheltenham if he's no chance this year, because there's no fun in it, really. Um, so I'm hoping that he might run well and get into the first three or four. That's Cool Jet under Brian Hayes. So Cool Jet, uh, around about 40 or 50 to 1, depending on where you're getting it at the moment, under Brian Hayes. So... Uh, there you go. We've pretty much tapped, uh, tipped all of the horses in the bumper there. So <laughs> I hope somebody, I hope somebody has an idea of what they're doing. Folks, happy punting today, and thanks very much for joining us. We'll talk to you again tomorrow. Cheers. Thanks, Jar. My thanks Hello. to Paddy Power, to John Duggan, and of course to uh, Johnny Ward. This is the Cheltenham Show on OTB Sports every day of the week of Cheltenham with Paddy Power. Don't feel like a punter, feel like a favourite this Cheltenham. If you missed any of the show, you can catch the full podcast back on the OTB Sports app. Keep an eye out on otbsports.com throughout the week where the team will be giving their daily picks. Get onto the, uh, the app and um, we'll send you details as well, of course. Uh, there's, that's all for today's show. Back tomorrow at half past ten with a detailed look ahead to day three and the Paddy Power Stairs Hurdle. See you tomorrow. Good luck. The Cheltenham Show on OTB Sports. Don't feel like a punter. Feel like a favourite this Cheltenham with Paddy Power. OTB AM. This is OTB.